Hey everybody and welcome back to another video. My name is Sid and I like making videos about math, programming, productivity, and a whole lot more. In today's video, I'm going to be talking to you guys about how I hosted my own hackathon and really teaching you how you do, could host your own hackathon and what the main trouble points of the process are, what's really hard about it, how you could navigate through those hard parts, and talking to you about some resources that might be helpful if you're planning on hosting your own hackathon. Before we get started though, check to see if you're subscribed. Most of my viewers aren't subscribed and if you subscribed, it would help me out a lot. Plus it's completely free and you can always unsubscribe later. All right, let's get straight into it. So first of all, why should you host your own hackathon? Why don't you just go to somebody else's hackathon, have fun there and eat your free food? Well, the reason I hosted my own hackathon in my high school was because I wanted to. But seriously, I hosted it because there weren't really any hackathons for high schoolers in North Carolina. I mean, some of the university's hackathons you could attend as a high schooler, but there weren't really any hackathons designed only for high schoolers. So I was like, all right, I guess I'll make one with some other people at my school. So the summer before my 11th grade year, I decided I was going to host a hackathon in my high school, and I ended up doing that my junior year with the help of some seniors. You know, I was going to host UniHacks, the name of our hackathon, so that every high schooler, um, at least at my school, would have the opportunity to participate in a hackathon because I know how helpful it is to actually be able to do one. And if you want to know why that's helpful, check out this video over here. I made a whole video about why hackathons are really good. In this video, I'll mostly talk about the hackathon that I hosted in 2021 as a virtual hackathon during COVID because it's a lot more uh, easy for you to plan as an organizer because it's just virtual and you don't have to deal with booking things and like booking actual physical food, catering, as well as an actual physical location for your hackathon to happen. It's a lot easier to do it online. And before I tell you how you can host it, let me tell you that it will be very hard and time consuming. So don't try to do it yourself at all. Try and find a few other people to work with. Otherwise you're gonna be in a whole lot of stress because this is just not something you can really do all by yourself. And if you can, you're a superhuman. It'd be even better if besides other students, you get your school administration to help you with the event. But if you're not in school, obviously that doesn't apply to you. So first of all, the first thing that you need to do before actually starting to plan your hackathon is pick a event format, whether it's hybrid, online, or digital, or in person, and also get an organizing team. There's a lot of things to do like marketing, outreach, communicating with sponsors, planning the event, planning workshops, and a lot of things to do. So you're gonna need quite a few people. Try and get four people. I did with only two, me and another uh, co-organizer, my senior year, and it was really, really hectic. Anyways, once you have that done, you're gonna need to figure out a date for your hackathon. Um, try and have it four to five months from when you start planning it because that gives you a lot of leeway to work with making it easier upon you and your fellow organizers and your school administration if you're working with them to actually plan the hackathon and make it really, really good. You know, pick a weekend um, and choose your time frame of your hackathon. Is it gonna be 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, 48 hours? What is it gonna be like? And then once you have all that information, you're at a pretty good place to start actually doing the hard work for planning your event. Now that you've done that, you need to actually have a place for all your hackers to talk to each other before the event. So make a Discord, uh, make a Discord server or a Slack channel. You can join my Discord server link in the description down below. Um, and this is where your hackers are going to communicate to each other. If they don't have teammates, this is where going to if they're, this is where they're going to find teammates. And you know, this is what you'll be using to send communications updates throughout the event and before the event. I would suggest making this, uh, you know, well in advance, but only sending out invites to people who've signed up about two weeks before the actual event. That way you won't have an empty Discord server just sitting around for a while with no one really typing in it. There's a lot of templates for Discord servers for hackathons and if you search them up, you'll find quite a few. Next, what you're gonna have to do is make a dev post for your event. And a dev post is basically what all hackathons use for people to submit their projects. People will submit their projects in, and include things like pictures of their project and about section of the project, um, you know, a GitHub link if there is one, as well as a deployed, as well as a link to the deployed version of the web app or app if there is one. And that's what the judges will use to judge the submissions and the participants. And the cool thing is that DevPost will make a nice little project gallery so you can browse through all the projects that people submitted for your hackathon. And of course, you can't have a hackathon without participants. So you're also gonna have to make a website with a registration form so that people can sign up for your hackathon and, you know, provide you all the important information that they need to, that you need to know, like their name and their t-shirt size. And of course, don't forget to ask for experience levels on the hackathon form because you need to make sure that you have adequate categories for prizes and winning and such. You need to make sure you have a beginner category, but we'll talk about that shortly. To make the entire process easier on yourself, especially if you're in high school, try partnering with your school administration to make the hackathon a reality. More often than not, if you tell them the benefits of, you know, 
working with code and computer science for young students and high schoolers, they'll be more than happy to help you. And if they're not, then there are other ways to do things, and we'll talk about that right now. Okay, I lied. Not right now, but in like 15 seconds. Anyways, to get the word out about your hackathon, you could use your teachers um, to, you know, tell their students, or you could get your friends to post on social media. You could post on social media. There's a whole bunch of ways to promote your hackathon and get people to sign up, and I hope you take advantage of them. You could get fundraising from your teachers and your school administration, right? But not every school has access to funds and not every school is really well connected where they can talk to companies to get funds. So how do you actually get funds for your hackathon? Because nobody wants to participate in a hackathon that doesn't give them a free something. They want free stickers at least. The most common way to actually get your hackathon funding is by becoming a MLH partner event. Now MLH stands for uh, Major League Hacking and they host a bunch of hackathons throughout the country and the world even. And they're not really the ones that host the hackathons. Different schools and organizations host those hackathons, but they partner with MLH for a farther reach as well as to get funding and a bunch of other cool things. Being an MLH partner event gives you access to like a thousand dollar fund, if I recall correctly, as well as, uh, you know, legitimacy because you can then reach out to sponsors. If you're an MLH partner event, they'll be like, oh, we know these guys, we know MLH, we've partnered with them before. You can reach out to those sponsors and boom, you suddenly have some sponsors that might want to help. And you know, it gives your event more people uh, to participate in. There'll be more people looking at your event and being like, oh, that's an MLH event, maybe I should check it out. And the way to become an MLH event is to actually fill out their application. It's on their website. I'll leave a link to it in the description down below. The application includes things like, um, you know, asking for your organizing teams like resumes and stuff, as well as how you're gonna plan the hackathon when it is. And I think they require you to apply like four to five months before your hackathon is actually a thing. So I would recommend that you apply as soon as possible, as soon as you know your hackathon is happening, because then they'll be able to reach out to you, schedule an interview, and you know, when you do get approved, now you have access to MLH's funds and it's a really, really fun time. Side note, I wasn't actually an MLH partner event because my school didn't want us to be, and so I went the way of getting my school to fund it. The second way to get your hackathon funded would to just be to reach out to sponsors yourself, which is very hard to do, or you could reach out to them to contact in your school, which again, not every school has. So this is the really, really hard way to do it. Third is you could try doing a fundraiser, right? You know, go around asking, uh, you know, telling people and telling students to tell their parents or other local businesses that, hey, we'll put your logo for your company on this website if you pay us X amount um, to help us host this event to get young people interested in computer science and coding, you know? If maybe they'll say yes, and then you'll have some sponsors. It's all very much a just reach out to many people, as many people as you can and you know, you hope that some of the mud that you throw out the wall ends up sticking. This step is very hard and you'll probably still be, you'll work through it the entire time while you're planning your hackathon every month. You know, you'll be going through a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, you can, there's gonna be a lot of back and forth, but I believe that you will get it done eventually and end up putting on a great event. As the date for the event draws nearer, you're gonna to want to find people to judge your, judge your submissions as well as people to, you know, volunteer their technical expertise to help with students or any hackers that might have problems with their projects during the event. You should try to give yourself at least a month and a half to do this because the people you'll be reaching out to are probably very busy and you'll likely need to reach out to a bunch of different people to actually get judges. Of course, if worse comes to worse, you could just judge it yourself or get some of your friends to judge the hackathon if they're not participating, but it's best to try and get some people that are in the industry. If you've already gotten sponsors, then it's really easy to talk to those sponsors and be like, hey, would you, do you know anybody at your company that might be interested to come over and judge a hackathon or volunteer at one? And if you are partnering with MLH, they do have um, MLH volunteers that will do this for you. So that again is very easy to do. Also, remember, before you actually tell your judges to go judge, remember to make a comprehensive rubric that specifically says one point, you give them one point if they do this, and 10 points if they do this. Because if you don't tell the judges exactly what point value is associated with what in a project, then they'll come up with their own rubric in their mind and then your scales won't be even and some judges will rate a lot harsher and some judges will be a lot more lenient. So it's best to come up with the rubric that you give to the judges rather than letting them think of everything by themselves. Something else that you have to be doing is planning out workshops and events for your hackathon. So you could have like a Tetris tournament uh, during the middle of your hackathon just as like a little break for people and you know workshops to improve their skills. You could have like an intro to web development workshop or an intro to machine learning and AI workshop or an intro to blockchain workshop. And again, MLH has a lot of resources for this and you don't even need to be a partner event to avail of those resources because it's all freely available on the internet. 
So during the event, you're gonna need to be on call basically the whole time, making sure that your event's running smoothly, making sure that workshops are being run on time, that you're continuously monitoring the Discord server or Slack channel and making sure that people's questions are getting answered, nobody's being too toxic, and that everybody's having a good and enjoyable time. Honestly, you're gonna have to be as many, in many places as you possibly can be, and it's gonna be very tiring, so make sure that you're taking breaks and organizing with your team so that um, you know everybody gets a little bit of time to breathe during the events weekend. That's all I really have to say about hosting your own hackathon. If you have any question, leave them in the comments down below. You could also DM me on Instagram or Twitter, links in the description, or you could join my Discord server and DM me over there or just post it in the Discord server and I'll get back to you in there. Again, link in the description. If you enjoyed the video, then as always, hit that like button, subscribe, and if you really wanna go the extra mile, then hit my Patreon, link in the description. As always, I hope you enjoy and I hope you have a great day.